This page was created to teach black history. Unfortunately, the American educational system was designed to exclude our real historical account, so we are here to dismantle it. It's time to enlighten those of us who have been kept in the dark. I, too, was a black man who didn't know enough about our own history, so I began to dig deeper and do my own research. I want people of all races and cultures to join together to learn our history as one. Here, I will share all of my findings. Please share and support Teaching Black History. The Story of Harriet Tubman Harriet Tubman was born Araminta Ross to enslaved parents, Harriet Green and Ben Ross. As with many enslaved people in the United States, neither the exact year nor place of Tubman's birth is known, but historians believe she was born in March of 1822. Her mother had nine children and struggled to keep her family together as slavery threatened to tear it apart. Unfortunately, three of her daughters were sold, separating them from the family forever. When a trader from Georgia approached their slave owner about purchasing her youngest son, she hid him for a month, aided by other enslaved people and freed men in the community. At one point, she confronted her owner about the sale. Finally, her slave owner and the Georgia man came toward the slave quarters to seize the child where she told them, you are after my son, but the first man that comes into my house, I will split his head open. The men backed away and abandoned the cell. Tubman's biographers agree that stories told about this event within this family influenced her belief in the possibilities of resistance. When she was five or six years old, her slave owner hired her out as a nursemaid to a woman named Miss Susan. Tubman was ordered to care for the baby in Rocket's cradle as it slept. When it woke up and cried, she was whipped. She later recounted a particular day when she was last five times before breakfast. She carried the scars for the rest of her life. Tubman also worked at the home of a planter named James Cook. She had to check the muskrat traps in nearby marshes, even after contracting measles. She became so ill that Cook sent her back to her slave owner, where her mother nursed her back to health. As she grew older and stronger, she was assigned to field and forest work, driving, piling, hauling logs as an adolescent. Tubman suffered a severe head injury when an overseer threw a two pound metal weight at another enslaved person who was attempted to flee. The weight struck Tubman instead, bleeding and unconscious. She was returned to her owner's house and laid on the seat of a loom where she remained without medical care for two days. After this incident, Tubman frequently experienced extremely painful headaches. She also began having seizures it would seemingly fall unconscious. This condition remained with her for the rest of her life. Around 1844, she married a free black man named John Tubman. Although little is known about him or their time together, the union was complicated because of her slave status. The mother's status dictated that of children and any children born to Harriet and John would be enslaved. Such blended marriages, free people of color marrying enslaved people, were not uncommon on the eastern shore of Maryland, where by this time, half the black population was free. Most African-American families had both free and enslaved members. Tubman changed her name from Armoretta to Harriet soon after her marriage. In 1849, Tubman became ill again, which diminished her value as a slave. Edward Broadus tried to sell her, but could not find a buyer. A week later, Broadus died. Tubman and her brothers Ben and Henry escaped from slavery on September 
17, 1849. Once they had left, Tubman's brothers had second thoughts. Ben may have just become a father. The two men went back, forcing Tubman to return with them. Soon afterward, Tubman escaped again, this time without her brothers. While her exact route is unknown, Tubman made use of the network known as the Underground Railroad. This informal but well-organized system was composed of free and enslaved blacks. With abolitionists and other activists, Tubman had to travel by night, guided by the North Star and trying to avoid slave catchers eager to collect rewards for fugitive slaves. A journey of nearly 90 miles by foot would have taken between five days and three weeks. The conductors in the Underground Railroad used deceptions for protection. At an early stop, the lady of the house instructed Tubman to sweep the yard so as to seem to be working for the family. When night fell, the family hid her in a cart and took her to the next friendly family's house. After reaching Philadelphia, she worked odd jobs and saved money. In December 1850, Tubman was warned that her niece and her two children would soon be sold. Tubman went to Baltimore where her brother-in-law hid her into the cell. A free black man named John Bowley made the winning bid for his wife. Then while the auctioneer stepped away to have lunch, they all escaped to a nearby safe house. When night fell, Bowley sailed the family on a log canoe 60 miles to Baltimore where they met with Tubman, who brought the family to Philadelphia. Earlier next year, she returned to Maryland to guide away other family members. During her second trip, she recovered her brother Moses and two unidentified men. Word of her explicits had encouraged her family and biographers agree that with each trip to Maryland, she became more confident. December 1851, Tubman guided a group of 11 fugitives, possibly including the Bowleys and several others. There is evidence to suggest that Tubman and her group stopped at the home of abolitionist and former slave, Frederick Douglass. Douglass and Tubman admired one another greatly as they both struggled against slavery. When an early biography of Tubman was being prepared in 1868, Douglas wrote a letter to honor her. Over 11 years, Tubman returned repeatedly to the Eastern Shore of Maryland, rescuing some 70 slaves in about 13 expeditions. She also provided specific instructions to 50 to 60 additional fugitives who escaped to the North. Because of her efforts, she was nicknamed Moses, alluding to the prophet in the book of Exodus who led the Hebrews to freedom from Egypt. Tubman's dangerous work required tremendous ingenuity. She usually worked during winter months to minimize the likelihood of being seen. Her journeys into the land of slavery put her at tremendous risk, and she used a variety of ways to avoid detection. Tubman once disguised herself with a bonnet and carried two live chickens to give the appearance of running errands. She carried a revolver and was not afraid to use it. The gun afforded some protection from the ever-present slave catchers and their dogs. However, she also purportedly threatened to shoot any escaped slave who tried to turn back on the journey since that would threaten the safety of the remaining group. Despite the best efforts of the slaveholders, Tubman and the fugitives in her train were never captured. Years later, she told an audience, I was conductor of the Underground Railroad for eight years, and I can say what most conductors can't say. I never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. When Lincoln finally issued the Emancipation Proclamation in January 1863, Tubman considered it an important step toward the goal of liberating all black people from slavery. She renewed her support for a defeat of the Confederacy later that year. 
Tubman became the first woman to lead an armed assault during the Civil War. On the morning of June 2nd, 1863, Tubman guided three steamboats across Confederate mines. Once ashore, the Union troops set a fire to the plantations, destroying infrastructure and seizing thousands of dollars worth of food and supplies. When the steamboats sounded their whistles, slaves throughout the area understood that it was being liberated. Tubman watched the slaves stampeded toward the boats. I never saw such a sight, she said later, describing a scene of chaos with women carrying steel steaming pots of rice, pigs squilling in bags slung over shoulders, and babies hanging around their parents' necks. Although their owners armed with handguns and whips tried to stop the mass escape, their efforts were nearly useless. During a train ride to New York in 1869, the conductor told her to move from a half price section into the baggage car. She refused, showing the government issued papers that entitled her to ride there. He cursed at her and grabbed her, but she resisted and he summoned two other passengers for help. While she clutched at the railing, they muscled her away, breaking her arm in the process. They threw her into the baggage car causing more injuries. As these events transpired, other white passengers cursed Tubman and shouted for the conductor to kick her off the train. Her act of defiance became a historical symbol, later cited when Rosa Parks refused to move from a bus seat in 1955. Despite her years of service, Tubman never received a regular salary was for years denied compensation. Her unofficial status and the unequal payments offered to black soldiers caused great difficulty in documenting her service, and the U.S. government was slow in recognizing its debt to her. Tubman married Private Nelson Charles Davis, even though he was 22 years younger than she was, on March 18, 1869. They adopted a baby girl in 1874 and lived together as a family. Nelson died on October 14, 1888, of tuberculosis at the turn of the 20th century. Tubman became heavily involved with the African-American Methodist Zion Church in Auburn. As Tubman aged, the seizures, headaches, and suffering from her childhood head trauma continued to plague her. At some point in the late 1890s, she underwent brain surgery at Boston's Massachusetts General Hospital. Unable to sleep because of pains and buzzing in her head, she asked a doctor if he could operate. He agreed, in her words, sawed open my skull and raised it open, and now it feels more comfortable. She had received no anesthesia for the procedure and reportedly chose instead to bite down on a bullet as she had seen Civil War soldiers do when their limbs were amputated. By 1911, Tubman's body was so frail that she was admitted into the rest home named in her honor. Surrounded by friends and family members, she died of pneumonia in 1913.